Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm very happy that we have this great webinar today, this afternoon, and I'm very happy and glad that you're all here. And I want to say just a few words before we start. So this webinar speaker today is Fabrizio Benedetti, who's affiliated with the University of Turin in Italy and Plateau Rosa in Switzerland. And I think we were all very excited for this talk today because as many of our early researchers, early career researchers have requested and asked for Fabrizio to give a talk in this webinar. I think this is this is just a great opportunity today. And Fabrizio is going to talk about placebo oxygen. What is it? And here on the picture on my slide, you see him receiving his Lifetime Achievement Award at the ZIPS conference a couple of weeks ago in Duisburg. So again, from my side, many congratulations on that. This is amazing. And yes, before we start with introducing Fabrizio and his talk, I would like to hand over to Steffi Hölzken, who will introduce our early career researcher speaker for today, who is Helena Klaus, and she will present her work that she is doing within the SFP. So Steffi. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Kathy. Um, yes, Helena Klaus, um, we're very happy that she will give our early career researcher talk today. Uh, Helena Klaus studied psychology in Vienna and now is a student of medicine in Essen and currently doing her practical year um, for her medical studies. And for her doctoral thesis, she conducted a systematic review in the lab of Ulrike Bingel about observational learning in placebo and nocebo research. And uh, she will present the results of her systematic review today. And I'm very excited to hear about that. So I'm handing over the microphone to you, Helena. You're still muted. Ah, now, right? Now we can yes, hear now you. Now we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Okay. Yeah, my name is Helena, and uh, today I want to talk about the systematic review that we are um, conducting in the Bingel Lab. It is about observationally induced placebo and nocebo effects, and I'm doing this work with and under the supervision of Angelika, Diana, and of course, Professor Bingel. Uh, today, I want to focus on influencing factors and clinical application. Oops. Okay, so um, as a quick warm up, maybe you can uh, imagine you have an appointment at the doctor's office or at the hospital. You might not really know what to expect. Um, you just go there and uh, a door opens and a person comes out and she or he seems quite happy with, with whatever just happened. So you might get the expectation, okay, this is going to be fine. I will be fine. On the other hand, if the door opens and the person steps out of the room and he or she seems super sad or in pain, you might think, oh my God, help, what is this going to be like? So this is a very short and very brief example of observational learning uh, where you always have a model and an observer. Observational learning has been shown to introduce and alter expectations, which in turn can affect treatment outcomes. And this leads to favorable or unfavorable outcomes. Uh, the first search on observational learning in placebo analgesia was conducted by Coloca and Benedetti in 2009. And ever since the number of articles and the interest in this research has been rising. And there are some Factors that might be um, relevant to this because um, observational learning is effective. It is, in case, non-invasive. It seems rather simple to alter treatment expectations and treatment outcomes in medical contexts. So this is why it is important to us. Uh, we conducted two systematic searches. The first one focusing on influencing factors and the second one on application fields of observational learning. You can see this flow chart um, showing the process of data selection. And we searched four different databases, which you can see on the right, uh, PubMed, Web of Science, Scopus, and PsycInfo. We were able to receive 21 hits for our first study or first search and 12 hits for our second search. 
The first search concentrated on these influencing factors. Um, we found that out of 21 studies, 20 found significant observationally induced effects. So it is in fact effective, right? Um, 17 were focusing on the field of pain. Uh, we found that the average si uh, effect size for placebo effects in the sample was larger than the effect size for nocebo effects in, in this um, sample. And there is still a meta-analysis needed. However, those results contain, like, contained in the study suggest that observational learning can induce higher effects than verbal instructions and lower effects than conditioning, approximately medium-sized. We also found that yet expectations are rarely assessed and might be like might need some further um, assessment in future studies. If we think about influencing factors, we might think about model factors and observation uh, like observer factors like the sex of a person, the gender, the status, the confidence, expertise, social conformity, empathy, and so on. And we want to know who do we learn best from and also who are the best learners, who is susceptible to observational learning. We um, tried to condense the findings in, um, in this graph. Um, on the left, you can see the influencing factors and on the x-axis, the number of conditions that have been testing, that have been testing these influencing factors. On the right side, you see the placebo conditions and on the left side, the nocebo conditions and the lighter bulbs mark the number of studies that investigated these respective influencing factors and the darker proportion within marks the number of significant results. We found that sometimes no observational main effect is reported and that sometimes the effects are not separately reported by high or low trait expression but rather reported together only in comparison to the control groups. However, we found some interesting results. Um, some of these influencing factors have only been investigated in only one study and others have larger samples, for example, empathy. We also found that some of the variables have only been tested in adverse conditions, but not in placebo conditions yet, or that some variables or influencing factor might lead to contradicting results. For example, in empathy, and we could think about whether those studies measure state empathy, trait empathy, if it makes a difference, or if empathy might be context dependent to observational learning. In our second search, we were focusing on application fields, and we were able to, uh, to divide the hits that we found into the categories prevention, rehabilitation, diagnostics, and therapy. And we found that um, observational learning is mainly used in psychosomatic conditions. However, not only. The highest effects were found for preventive measures. And especially if users, for example, users of a uh, digital healthcare application were actively involved. I want to thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to what is next to come in this interesting research field. And of course, very, very curious about the talk of Professor Benedetti. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Helena. This is very, very interesting data, I think. Um, are there any questions? Whoops. I see some clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Questions around, otherwise I take the chance. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if um, you have that um, on the top of your head right now. Um, was there a common mechanism by which they induce social learning in these different studies? Like, did they mostly use videos or um, how, how were social learning effects actually induced in these studies? Or was it always different? Um, in fact, almost half of the studies used um, video observation and half used um, live model. And there was like a setup, for example, a person entering a waiting area or something like this. Okay, so really elaborate paradigms, actually. Great. Okay, if there are no further questions, I thank you again, Helena, and I hand over to Jana to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, thank you, Steffi. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you uh, Fabrizio Benedetti today. And even if uh, many of you already know him, 
I will like uh, like introduce him in short. He's a professor of neuropsychology and human physiology of the at the University of Tur um, Turin uh, Medical School, and he's also a director of medicine and physiology of hypoxia at the Plate Rosa Laboratories um, in Samad, Switzerland. And yeah, as um, you all know, he identified some like really fundamental and like basic mechanisms of um, yeah placebo, but also nocebo responses in like uh, different um, medical conditions such as pain, but also like movement disorders like Parkinson. And yeah, I also remember um, the exciting talk at the SIPS conference in Duisburg in May. And um, yeah, I really remember the, like the question you raised about the evolutionary significance of the placebo effect and like the importance of um, yeah the placebo effect and where does it come from and the evolutionary perspective. But today, like we are really looking forward to your insights about your work on like placebo oxygen. Um, so thank you very much for like being here, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. Let me thank uh, Elena for uh, for the beautiful presentation. Uh, I think I think observational learning, uh, more in general, social learning, uh, is really very very important. It, it is a powerful way to induce placebo and nocebo responses. I will say something about observational learning and social learning in my talk. Well, actually, at the very end of uh, of my uh, talk today. So, uh, thank you uh, for uh, for this invitation. Let me share the screen. Uh, uh, let me see. Okay. Can you see it? Great. Okay. Uh, this is a quite a strange title, placebo oxygen, you know? So what is it exactly? <clears throat> Why placebo oxygen? Well, today uh, I would like to uh, describe uh, what we know today about uh, a placebo effect in uh, critical uh, life functions. Uh, it is quite an unusual uh, approach because, uh, you know, critical life functions are quite difficult to study, to investigate. Well, of course, oxygen <clears throat> is, uh, is really crucial in critical life functions. So the key question today is uh, in this talk, 45, more or less 45, 50 minutes, the key question is, uh, 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 can oxygen be replaced with a placebo, uh, it uh, seems uh, quite a bizarre question because uh, the answer could be at first sight, no, it is not possible. It is not possible to replace a real oxygen with fake oxygen. But you will see that uh, actually there are some very, very interesting uh, findings, and I would like to tell you something about our work on placebo, placebo oxygen. So let me start with the overview of my talk today. Uh, the first, the first question is, uh, I will try to answer is, uh, can placebo be studied for criti critical life functions? The second point will be the high altitude model of oxygen shortage. Uh, then something about nocebo, uh, you will see that I will talk about observational learning in this context, observational nocebo effect, which are quite powerful in the context of uh, uh, placebo and nocebo oxygen. Uh, and uh, at the end of my talk, some implications for clinical trials. I think that there are many clinical implications. You will appreciate the clinical implications uh, particularly not so much in routine medical practice, I mean in medical practice as well, but uh, particularly in the context of clinical trial methodology. So let's start with the uh, <clears throat> with, uh, 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 placebo effect in uh, critical life functions. Well, first of all, I would like to, this is an overview from the placebo literature and the concept uh, that is emerging today is that uh, placebos on the one hand and uh, drugs on the other share common mechanisms 
of action. So for example, here you see there are uh, the three or four examples. Uh, the first two or three examples are about pain. For example, we know that the narcotic drugs bind to, uh, bind to uh, more pure receptors, but today we know that uh, placebos actually activate the very same more pure receptors. And this holds true for endocannabinoids as well. For example, agonists of the CB1 cannabinoid receptors, uh, like uh, you know, tetra uh, hydrocannabinol binds to the CB1 receptors. But today we know that placebos use the very same mechanism of action. They activate the CB1 cannabinoid receptors. What about headache? We know that the non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit cyclooxygenase, COX, cyclooxygenase. But today we know that placebos uh, <clears throat> can uh, act on the same mechanism, which means that they can inhibit cyclooxygenase. This is true for Parkinson's disease as well, like anti-Parkinson dopaminergic drugs that bind to dopamine receptors. The story is not different <clears throat> compared to pain, so today we know that placebos activate dopamine receptors like anti-Parkinson drugs. So what about uh, critical life functions? Uh, these are quite interesting because we are in uh, severe, usually in the clinical context, in severe conditions. For example, uh, critical life functions are very much dependent on oxygen. We can call this function oxygen dependent critical life functions. So uh, here there is a question mark. What about a placebo? Can a placebo mimic the effect of oxygen like uh, uh, an anti-Parkinson drug, like a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug, like an opioid uh, uh, drug and so forth? So I will try to answer this question, which is quite, uh, which is quite important, I think, because uh, <clears throat> we can go beyond the pharmacological approach with drugs or with psychological approach, and we can study directly the functions of oxygen. So uh, what are the, uh, critical, uh, the critical life function? Well, there are at least four critical life functions. The first is ventilation, of course. Uh, ventilation through the lungs. The second is uh, oxygenation, the passage of oxygen from the lungs to the blood, the bloodstream, you know. The third uh, critical life function is uh, circulation. And the fourth is perfusion, perfusion of the brain, for example, here, or perfusion of other organs like the liver or the kidney, you know. These are the four critical life functions. If they don't work, we die. So when there is an oxygen shortage, what we call, you see here, when there is a, a decrease in oxygen pressure or oxygen pressure in the blood or in the uh, atmosphere around us, <coughs> what we call hypoxia, there are several compensatory responses. For example, there is an increase in ventilation. This is not surprising, of course. There is, uh, there is uh, an increase in cardiac output, and this is not surprising. This is a compensatory response uh, because there is a sh an oxygen shortage. And there is an increase in perfusion, for example, in perfusion, blood perfusion in the brain due to uh, vasodilation. So the question I will try to answer today is, uh, is there any role for placebo in these critical life functions. So I will say something about ventilation. I will say something about perfusion, a particularly brain perfusion, a, a, a more in general vasodilation. And I will say something about uh, uh, cardiac output. <clears throat> so the first question is uh, an ethical question. Is it ethical to study uh, critical life functions with placebos. This is an ethical problem <clears throat> for uh, investigating critical uh, vital functions with uh, uh, placebo to study placebo effects. 
there are many opinions by ethics committee. <clears throat> I tell you something about the ethics committee in Italy and uh, in Switzerland where I work. For example, uh, <clears throat> it is considered unethical uh, to work with patients at the bedside. This is not surprising. So, for example, we never got the permission to work with the placebo in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the bedside, for example, in heart failure or in uh, uh, respiratory failure condition. Uh, what about uh, hyperbaric chamber? Hyperbaric chamber, you can decrease uh, the um, uh, oxygen pressure. Well, this is considered by ethics committees uh, partially ethical. <clears throat> but again, we never got the uh, permission uh, and approval by an ethics committee to perform uh, 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 placebo administration in this condition. <clears throat> so uh, the high altitude model is uh, an excellent model to study, to study oxygen shortage and the effects of the placebo on oxygen shortage because uh, uh, by, uh, it is considered uh, uh, ethically acceptable by our ethics committee. So this is the reason why we work at high altitude. Well, we work at high altitude for two reasons. First, because it is ethically acceptable by ethics committee. And the second reason is because I love mountains, you know? <clears throat> so I like to live in the mountains for uh, days, for weeks, so it is a very nice, a very exciting environment to, to do research and to do clinical research. So uh, uh, what about the high altitude model of oxygen shortage? Let me say something about the high altitude model. Well, these are our uh, Plateau Rosa laboratories at high altitude, uh, at an altitude of 3,500 meters. What is the crucial point here? The crucial point is that at 3,500 meters, the uh, oxygen pressure you see here, the oxygen pressure is 64% compared to the sea level. So there is a severe hypoxia condition. There is a severe uh, uh, oxygen shortage. <clears throat> so this is an excellent model to study different, different uh, uh, physiological parameters at different conditions with uh, uh, a placebo, with the administration of placebo. Just let me show two very short videos uh, just to give you an idea of what is going on when you give uh, a, a, a placebo oxygen, fake oxygen. Now I'm going to tell you what uh, a placebo oxygen is actually. Well, this is a, a, a volunteer, a healthy volunteer performing a stepping exercise. You see here, I don't want to go into the, uh, the details, but uh, he performed a stepping exercise. Uh, these are the condition, the uh, oxygen pressure in the air outside is uh, uh, about uh, 102 uh, compared to 160 at the sea level. So you see there is a, a severe hypoxic condition. And this is blood oxygen saturation. At the sea level is about 98, 99. Here at the th uh, 3,500 meters is uh, uh, less than uh, 90%. So this is what we call severe hypoxia, a severe oxygen shortage. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of uh, a couple of videos uh, just before placebo administration, uh, placebo oxygen, and uh, right after uh, placebo oxygen administration. What is placebo oxygen exactly? You see that uh, these subjects uh, uh, breathe from uh, uh, two oxygen tanks. Placebo oxygen uh, is that they believe they are breathing 100% uh, oxygen, but actually the tanks are empty. Uh, they don't know that, so they expect an increase in, they, in their performance. 
And just let me show you what happens just before placebo administration. You see that this is a really tiring uh, exercise, a tiring task. Then we give placebo oxygen. Huh? So they breathe from empty, they don't know that of course, from empty tanks. And this is what happens right after uh, fake oxygen administration, I'm sorry, fake oxygen administration just before and this is right after oxygen administration, there is a huge difference in performance. <clears throat> it is not necessary to describe, you know, the difference between the before and after placebo administration. Not all subjects respond like this, uh, like this, uh, this one. We don't know why. Some people respond pretty well to place uh, placebo oxygen administration. Some other people uh, do not. We don't know exactly why. But the main question is uh, <clears throat> what is going on in the body of these subjects, good placebo oxygen responders? What is going on? Why is there an increase in performance? Is there a change in their ventilation, in their perfusion in the brain, in their heart rate, for example? <clears throat> Just let me show you here. Here we are at uh, you see here, 3,500 meters, uh, oxygen pressure, as I said before, is 64% compared to the sea level. This is what we measure, PG2, prostaglandin E2. This is very important in brain perfusion because uh, it is uh, PG2 is a vasodilator. So if there is an increase in PG2, it means that there is an increase in vasodilation with an increase in brain perfusion. Then we measure headache. It is a typical symptom of uh, high altitude. Fatigue, another typical symptom of high altitude. Ventilation, which is measured liters per minute. Uh, pH, blood pH, uh, oxygen saturation, Oxygen saturation is important uh, because uh, it tells us uh, 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 the uh, concentration, the pressure of oxygen in the blood, in the body, and the heart rate you see here, <clears throat> cardiac output. So if we give a placebo for the first time, you know, which means uh, uh, we, uh, we tell these subjects, uh, now I'm going to give you uh, one hundred percent oxygen. So you have to expect an increase in your performance. Uh, you see, this is what happens: placebo given, placebo oxygen given for the first time. You see here, this is uh, 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 to the left, just before placebo administration. Post uh, to the right after placebo administration. Nothing changes with the exception of fatigue. There is a decrease in fatigue, which means that fatigue is very sensitive to placebo, <clears throat> to placebo administration, in this case, to placebo oxygen administration. There is no change here in, uh, in uh, pink, in uh, heart rate. There is no change in headache. There is no change in ventilation. There is no change in uh, PG to but there is a decrease in fatigue. When uh, I tell the subjects, now we are going to breathe 100% oxygen, but actually, actually it is fake oxygen. But we can turn these uh, no responders uh, into very good responders uh, if we perform uh, a conditioning procedure. So look at this, we give uh, oxygen, real oxygen for the first time, and you see that uh, in orange, of course, there is an increase in the blood oxygen saturation. There is a response here in heart rate, there is a response in PG2, there is a response in blood pH and so forth. Then we give, a, this is not surprising because this is a typical response to oxygen administration. Then we give oxygen for the second time and again, we have uh, different responses to oxygen administration. Then we give oxygen for the third time. And again, there is a, a response to oxygen. 
But then on the fourth time, we replace oxygen with a placebo. And now you can see that the placebo can mimic the effect of oxygen. <clears throat> this is a placebo responses after oxygen preconditioning for three times. You can use the two or three trials, preconditioning trial to induce these placebo, uh, these placebo responses. You see that now there is a placebo response a placebo effect for heart rate, a placebo response for a headache, for PG2, and so forth. Please note that uh, oxygen in the body, this one in orange, does not increase because this is a placebo, <clears throat> you know? So in spite of a very low oxygen in the body, you can get this oxygen, uh, this uh, placebo, uh, placebo responses. So what happens if we further decrease the oxygen pressure? Here we are at uh, 5,500 meters uh, on the Monte Rosa uh, heart. Uh, here, the crucial point that the uh, uh, oxygen pressure is 57%, per, uh, do you remember before? At uh, 3,500 meters, it's 64%. At 5,500 meters, um, uh, 45, sorry, 4,500 meters is 50 percent compared to the sea level. So, really severe epoxic condition, severe oxygen shortage. Uh, can you get the very same responses? The answer is yes, you can. Look at this. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is no difference. You give a placebo for the first time. And you see that fatigue is very sensitive. You don't need a preconditioning with oxygen, but you need a preconditioning uh, to get placebo responses uh, for uh, other physiological parameters, like uh, you see here, heart rate, uh, pH, PG2, ventilation, and so forth. If you give a placebo, here we are, we, uh, there is a, a decrease, uh, you see up to 57% of oxygen compared to the sea level. We give a place, uh, oxygen for the first time. These are the typical responses to oxygen. For the second time, for the third time, and now if you replace oxygen with a placebo uh, at, at uh, 4,500 meters, you can get the very same placebo responses. It is really powerful. I mean, oxygen preconditioning is really, really very, very powerful. Well, what happens if you go up to 5,500 meters? Uh, we, have, uh, we, we had to go outside Europe because in Europe there are no <clears throat> mountains higher than uh, about uh, less than 5,000 meters. Uh, here we are uh, uh, the Pico Simon Bolivar in Colombia, in South America. Here we are in Alaska at the Nali Mountains. But the crucial point here is that at five, you see here at 5,500 meters, uh, uh, oxygen pressure is 50%, is half compared with, to the sea level. <clears throat> so there is a, a, a really severe hypoxia condition. <clears throat> uh, well, if you perform exactly the same uh, experiments, and uh, you give placebo for the first time, you see that uh, there is no change of all these parameters with the exception of fatigue. You see that decrease of fatigue is much smaller than at 4,500 meters and 3,500 uh, meters, uh, but still there is a powerful placebo response for fatigue when you give a placebo for the first time without oxygen preconditioning. Now, what happens if you perform uh, oxygen preconditioning? You see here, you give oxygen for the first time. <clears throat> Again, these are the responses to oxygen. Oxygen for the, the second time, oxygen for the third time, but on the fourth time, you replace oxygen, oxygen with a placebo, and you can see that there is still a significant placebo effect with a reduction of oxygen up to 50%, half, half of, of, uh, of the oxygen uh, compared to, uh, to, the sea, to the sea level. 
So it is really powerful uh, uh, effect. Uh, we don't know beyond a uh, uh, 50% reduction, oxygen reduction. We don't know, for example, if you go up to Mount Everest, uh, I don't think you can see this effect because on Mount Everest, we are on, on uh, uh, the death uh, zone. So it's probably you cannot see, you cannot get these placebo, these placebo responses. But please note that uh, all these responses after preconditioning with oxygen, uh, occur in spite the oxygen, blood oxygen saturation is very, very low, 80%. I remind you that uh, the sea level, the normal oxygen saturation is about here, 100%, 98 to 99, <clears throat> 98 to 99%. So it's still powerful effect. So uh, to uh, sum up, I mean, to summarize these, uh, this finding, uh, up to 50% reduction of oxygen, you see that uh, placebo can mimic oxygen for uh, brain perfusion. We have a, a, an indirect measure of, uh, of brain perfusion by by measuring, by measuring PG2, uh, which is a powerful vasodilator at the, at the level of the brain. Uh, placebo can mimic uh, oxygen for ventilation and placebo can uh, mimic oxygen for circulation. But it cannot mimic, uh, this is not surprising. surprising. Uh, placebo has no effect, cannot mimic oxygen. Uh, for uh, oxygenation, which means the passage of oxygen from the lungs to, uh, to, um, uh, to the bloodstream, you know. Uh, it is not surprising be because there is no involvement of the brain. In this case, uh, the passage of oxygen uh, from the lung to uh, the bloodstream is a direct passage with no involvement of the central nervous system. And uh, the other point, I think it's quite important, placebo has a powerful, really powerful effect on fatigue, <clears throat> much more powerful than on pain. For example, if you give a placebo at high altitude, if you give a placebo for the first time, you cannot see a reduction in pain, but you can see a reduction in fatigue. So placebo is really, I mean, fatigue is very sensitive to placebo administration, to expectation, you know, what you expect in this case, you get a reduction in, a reduction in, in, in fatigue. So the answer to the question, uh, can you see here, this was uh, the second on the first slide, can a placebo, can a placebo mimic the effect of oxygen? Yes. Of course, there are the limits. What we know today, as far as we know today, I mean, uh, as far as we know today, 50% uh, 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 oxygen reduction uh, can uh, still induce powerful placebo effects. Um, what about nocebo, a nocebo effect in the opposite direction? What does it mean exactly? The question here is uh, what happens if uh, we breathe fake oxygen. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, do we experience adverse events, the same adverse events, the same side effects of oxygen? Well, uh, as far as we know today, at least two mechanisms uh, have been uh, uncovered. The involvement of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and the involvement of COX, of cyclooxygenase of the cyclooxygenase pathway. Well, let's start with uh, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. You see here, this is uh, uh, nocebo oxygen, fake oxygen. This is what we tell the subjects, uh, possible adver adverse events you will experience. Headache, these are typically adverse events of oxygen breathing, oxygen inhalation, you know. Uh, headache, chest pain, abdominal pain, and cough. So, uh, uh, very to be very, uh, I mean, I want to be, I, I don't want to go into the details, 
But there is uh, an involvement uh, of uh, corticotropin releasing factor, the uh, adrenocorticotrope hormone uh, and cortisol, uh, when you expect uh, a negative uh, effects, adverse events, uh, uh, in spite of your breathing uh, fake oxygen, <clears throat> as I showed you before. Well, what is really interesting is that uh, uh, subjects who uh, report no adverse events or only one adverse event or two adverse events have show no change in CRH, no change in ACTH, no change in cortisol. But those subjects who report three or four adverse events show an increase in CRH, ACTH, and cortisol. Three or four, I remind you, three or four adverse events, these are the adverse events, headache, chest pain, abdominal pain, and cough. <clears throat> there is a correlation. We found a correlation between, uh, between uh, uh, the nocebo effect, nocebo oxygen challenge in adulthood. You see here, we studied 378 uh, subjects at age about approximately 22 years old, but the same 38, um, 378 subjects, uh, uh, we found uh, prenatal clinical records of prenatal maternal cortisol. There is, a there is a correlation. There is a correlation, which is, I think, quite interesting. This is from a clinical, from a clinical point of view. Uh, and I, I show you the correlation here. Uh, you see uh, here uh, to the left, this is uh, the prenatal maternal cortisol during the first trimester of pregnancy, the second trimester of pregnancy, and the second trimester of pregnancy. This is the normal level of maternal cortisol in the first, this is the normal in the second, this is the normal in the second. I'm sorry, this is a, a mistake in the third in the third trimester <clears throat> of pregnancy. And here you see the adverse events during here, the nocebo challenge. <clears throat> no adverse event, zero, one, two, three, four adverse events. These are the, the adverse events. Headache, again, as before, chest pain, abdominal pain, and cough. So look, look at here, for example, only those subjects reporting three and four adverse events at an age of 22 showed a abnormal level of uh, prenatal maternal cortisol. Only those who reported three and four adverse events showed in the first trimester cortisol level higher than normal. This is true for the second trimester as well. You see here, only those reporting three and four adverse events showed uh, 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 in uh, uh, prenatal life, maternal cortisol uh, showed uh, uh, cortisol level above normal. And this is true for uh, the third trimester only those reporting two, three, four adverse events in adulthood showed an increase in uh, above normal of a prenatal maternal cortisol. So there is a there is a correlation. There is a correlation, uh, and probably this is not surprising because an increase in prenatal maternal cortisol can affect. I have no time to discuss this point, but uh, prenatal uh, higher levels of prenatal. Maternal cortisol can affect many behaviors and many, many diseases in adulthood, um, in, uh, in the children, but not only in children, in adults as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Cox pathway is involved as well, uh, cyclooxygenase pathway. If you go up to high altitude, you see here, if you go up to high altitude, there is an increase in uh, cyclooxygenase uh, activity. We can measure cyclooxygenase activity by assessing 
the levels of uh, prostaglandin D2, PGD2, PG2, PGF2, and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> so you see, if you go up uh, to, uh, for example, 3,500 meters, there is an increase in PG2, PGF2, PGI2. This is the typical biological response. These are the biological factors. What is the biological factor in, in this case? Hypoxia, oxygen shortage. But now you can increase uh, cyclooxygenase activity uh, <clears throat> with uh, 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 psychological, negative psychological factors, negative expectations. In this case, the subjects read 80% of blood oxygen saturation, which is really very low, but actually their real blood oxygen saturation is 95, which is normal. So they expect, because they believe their blood oxygen saturation is 80 and not 95, you can see this uh, can uh, further increase uh, the activity of cyclooxygenase. You see that there is a further increase of PG2, PGF2, PGI2, and so forth. And uh, well, the last, probably, Elena, you are very much interested in the, in the social, uh, 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 in social learning, in observational learning, observation of others suffering from uh, uh, high uh, altitude sickness, uh, mountain sickness, uh, can further increase the, uh, 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 the activity of cyclooxygenase. You can see that uh, only biological factors here to the left, biological factors and psychological factors here in the center, uh, biological factors and psychological factors and social factor, observational factors can further increase the uh, uh, activity of cyclooxygenase. So you see that, uh, that uh, both psychological and uh, social factors uh, are really very important in the, the experience, you know, for example, in mountain sickness. Unfortunately, I have no time in 45, 50 minutes to go into the details, but, uh, but uh, 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 from a clinical point of view, for example, a headache, high altitude headache, uh, the more you go up to uh, high altitude, uh, the more you experience the, the clinical symptoms like, like headache. Um, well, uh, implications for clinical, for clinical trials. <clears throat> what are the implications for clinical trials? This is a summary for the possible implications of clinical trials. You see here that there is a progressive increase in cyclooxygenase and headache when you, uh, when you uh, have only biological factors, biological factors and psychological factors, biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. So the main question is what happens if you give a placebo <clears throat> in this condition only when the biological factors are present? or when the biological, psychological, social factors are present. What we should expect, <clears throat> actually, we should expect the small placebo effect here, only when biological factors are involved, but we should expect a large um, uh, placebo effect when biological, psychological, and social factors are involved. Well, actually, this is what happens. You see here, here there are two groups of, uh, of subjects. In red, this group of subjects are told about the possibility to experience headache. So they have negative expectation. This is what we call, uh, we call uh, the, the nocebo group. Uh, the yellow group here, uh, they don't have any information. So they don't know the, about the possibility to experience, to experience headache when they go up to, to high altitude. So then we bring them to high altitude, uh, we induce headache, and you see that there is a different response. There is an increase here in headache and PGE2 in the no information group. 
but there is a, a dramatic increase in headache and PG2 in the, those subjects who were informed about the possibility of uh, experiencing headache. Um, this nocebo, <clears throat> the difference is the nocebo component. So what is really interesting, when you give a placebo, for example, a placebo pill or placebo oxygen, whatever you like, I mean, <clears throat> it is not different. Huh? When you give a placebo, you have a huge response here, but you have no response here. What does it mean? It means that uh, probably placebos are effective only when a pre-existing nocebo effect is present. This is quite interesting from uh, a clinical trial point of view, because uh, it would be important to assess whether or not a pre-existing nocebo effect is present. This is the real clinical trial. And uh, you see here in this clinical trial, we compare aspirin versus placebo, like in any clinical trial, this is the standard clinical trial. But in this clinical trial, there is a comparison between aspirin and placebo with a pre-existing nocebo effect. This is the condition. <clears throat> Told about the possibility of experiencing headache and going up here, yeah, going up to high altitude. And this is the trial at high altitude. You see that uh, when aspirin is compared with a placebo, there is uh, an, a placebo, uh, I'm sorry, an effect, a drug effect, a response of PGD2, PG2, PGF2, and so forth. The response in pain, experience, headache, you know. When you give aspirin, there is no placebo effect in this case. But in this group of subjects, uh, this one, this group of subjects, this comparison between aspirin and placebo, you see that, uh, that uh, there is a drug effect for PG, for prostaglandin, and for pain, but there is a placebo effect as well. So again, the question is uh, uh, the previous one. Are placebos effective only when, at least in some conditions, are placebos effective only when a pre-existing nocebo effect is present? Well, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, requires uh, further investigation uh, uh, particularly, particularly in the setting, in the setting of clinical of, of clinical trial. So, at the very end of my 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 talk, I think my time is up. Uh, these are uh, I summarized uh, four uh, conclusions, which I think uh, can be quite important uh, for future research. The first conclusion is that oxygen dependent critical life functions are sensitive, at least in part, of course, to placebos. Uh, the second uh, is that placebo effects uh, have been found for uh, 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 oxygen reduction as large as 50%, which I think is quite, uh, quite large. Uh, third conclusion, although many ethical limitation do exist. Well, of course, modern and routine clinical practice are welcome, uh, even though it's quite difficult from an ethical point of view, because there are many ethical limitations at the bedside, you know, in uh, real patient. And the fourth is uh, from a methodological point of view in the setting of clinical trials, uh, clinical trials may benefit from this finding uh, for this reason. For example, you have to consider that uh, sometimes uh, pre-existing nocebo effects are important for placebo effects to occur. So I think if uh, we find a method to identify a nocebo response to see whether or not in different conditions, not, not in this model of high altitude, but in other medical conditions, pain, for example, or Parkinson's disease, we can identify if we can identify a nocebo response, we can see and uh, we can uh, <clears throat> assess whether or not placebo uh, is effective only when uh, uh, only on a pre-existing nocebo nocebo effect. Well, of course, last but not least, thank you very much to all my collaborators in Italy and Switzerland, 
uh, just to tell you, this is quite important. Uh, all these findings come from a very close collaboration, very close interaction between psychologists, neurophysiologists, uh, neurologists, the neuroimager, endocrinologists, uh, and so and, and so forth. Uh, thank you very much for listening.